Hello, everybody. This is episode number 97 of the Beersmith Podcast, and it's early February 2015. Today, my guest is Michael Moraz from Moraz Brewing Company, and we're going to discuss starting a brewery on a shoestring. Thank you to this week's sponsor, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They're now offering a full six issues a year, up from four, at a great discount. They're offering a new discount code now, which gives you 15% off everything they sell, including subscriptions and training. The new code is Beersmith2015. I encourage you to check out this great new magazine for homebrewers at beerandbrewing.com and use the offer code Beersmith2015 to get your 15% discount today. I also want to mention my mobile brewing software, Beersmith Mobile, at beersmith.com slash mobile. Create, edit, and brew your recipes from your phone or tablet, and share or find new recipes from tens of thousands of recipes on the Beersmith Cloud. Beersmith Mobile is a perfect complement to Beersmith Brewing Software, and you can find it on iTunes, Google Play, or the Amazon App Stores. Give Beersmith Mobile a try today. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, my guest is Michael Moraz of Moraz Brewing Company in El Dorado Hills, California. Michael started brewing in 2006 and rapidly rose to Home Brewer of the Year for California in 2008. He launched Moraz Brewing at MorazBrewingCompany.com in May of 2013. Michael's been on three times before in episodes number 42, 57, and 72 discussing sour and Belgian beers. Michael, it's uh, great to have you back on the show. Brad, thanks to be on. It's nice to be on the show. Thank you for having me back. So today we're going to talk a little bit about your uh, nano brewery startup that we we did discuss back in episode number fifty seven, uh, which was right before you opened, right? Yeah, it's almost been two years, so I can't, can't don't quite remember the date that we talked, but May first is when we opened. So we're getting almost yeah. I think we mark. talked in uh, I think it was around March or so. It was yeah, a few months before some, you opened. About the same time. So in uh, early 2013, you were preparing to open up your nano brewery on a shoestring. Can you bring us up to date real quick? Yeah. Um, you know, the thought process is we're going to start small. We'll grow organically and see where it takes us. If we stay just selling most of our beers to the tap room, we're fine with that. And, you know, things have been exceedingly growing exponentially, um, even in the last six months. So, you know, more and more of our beers are coming to market mm-hmm. and we're making a more of an effort. So um, it's been going really well. So, uh, how much beer are you making now? Um, we are just about, if, if you go calendar, I think we did almost 400, um, from January till December, 400 barrels. Um, we will be, if you include just the last six months, we're about 500 barrels. 500 barrels this year, right? You will probably do more than that for 2015. So uh, you sent me some sample beers I'm enjoying now. Now tell me, tell me a little about this uh, this one here, this peach. That's our Saison J Peach. It's a Saison aged in um, red wine barrels with um, some peaches. Added a little Brett, little lacto to kind of tarten it up and dry it out. Um, turned out really well. So it had some it's, good it's response. It's very interesting because yeah. it's got the sour taste in it. It's got the uh, you know, the peach is very detectable. Yeah. It's uh, it's very unique. I've never had a beer quite like this. Yeah, we didn't want to go over the top of the peach, and obviously didn't want to go over the top of the sour too. We wanted to be a beer, um, and then have some nice finish to it, kind of an approachable sour that you can finish. Um, you know, some of those amazing sours are just so over the top; they're hard to hard to open without three or four friends. So this one kind of fits the in, right in between. So you uh, you seem to be focusing on Belgian and sour beers, right? Yeah, that's always been my uh, call it labor of love. I really like those styles. A little bit more artisanship in those style of beers, and they give me a little bit more creativity um, as far as you know the blending of the barrels um, and obviously the ingredients and the different things we can do with them. You know, we do very well with our American styles too, but I really enjoy making the Belgian style beers. It's uh, it's pretty good. Yeah. I've enjoyed that, and yeah, I've got three more here. I'm looking forward to having shortly. <laughs> well, thank you. So how uh, how big's your brewery now? I think you started out at three barrels, and you were when I talked to you, you were TIG welding equipment with uh, with uh, dairy tanks, if I recall. Yeah, so it, we started out as three barrel, and um, we're five barrel now. We have a five barrel uh, boil kettle, and we mm-hmm. just finished um, completing a bigger mash tun because we do a few higher gravity beers, and it's hard to obviously get the the full full fermentation with a short. Um, mashed and that was our limiting factor so we we finished 
um, installing our technically, which is a full five barrel mash ton. Now we'll do almost, mm-hmm. it'll fit almost 500 pounds of grain. So, so that's uh, five barrels yeah. of beer. How many fermenters are you running? Um, we run two jacketed fermenters and we have another, um, it's about a 320 gallon plastic tank that we use for blending. Um, obviously, and then we use that for our beers that come out of the barrel as far as bottle bottling and everything else. So, so, so we don't want to tie up most of our uh, Belgian style beers are bottle conditioned, so we don't need to put them in stainless. Mm-hmm. So, I, I mean, you got to be brewing almost every day to get 500 barrels out though, right? Yeah, we, it's, it's been, we do about, um, twice a week, but every day consists of a double brew. So when we get that done in about eight, eight hours, so we're pretty efficient. How, uh, uh, how has the expansion gone? Um, it's been good. Um, obviously we pretty much kind of catch people up to speed. We're in a thousand square foot facility, um, kind of in more of a, a retail center, not quite industrial park. I didn't want to be um, out in the middle of um, an industrial area without AC or air conditioning. In the summer times around up in Northern California where we are, um, we see a few days above 100, so it does get hot. And our colds are nowhere near as cold as you guys, but um, it is nice to have a heated and air conditioned tap room. Um, and obviously it's a half a mile from my house, so that makes it easy. My commute's really nice. So five, barrels, then, you know, f- five barrels out of 1,000 square feet? Um, that's, that's everything. So to give you a logistics side of, um, the brewery itself, we have two, um, cold box rooms that hold our kegs. One's for outside storage and it's about 60 square feet. And the second one is for our primary storage for our, um, inside our tap room. It's about another 60 square feet. And the brewery itself is only 240 square feet. Um, so it's pretty small. Everything's cramped. Um, and then we have a second storage room for our grain and our barrels, which is about another 100 square feet. And then the rest of it's the tap room, the bathroom, and all the other am- amenities that go along with that. So now, now, one of the interesting things is, you you know, this is really something that you put together on a shoestring with just, you know, the money that you had in savings. And I think you had a few small investors, right? Yeah. We decided that we um, wanted to do it pretty much grassroots and, you know, money out of pocket and not spend a bunch of money. Uh, and that goes along with some of the beers we make. You know, I wanted to be able to make those beers and not be rushed either by investors or cash flow or have issues on that side. So um, that's kind of our motto is we want to be more artisanship. Um, we pretty much made the whole brewery ourselves um, to the tap room, um, made most of the brewing equipment from dairy tanks or whatever else you can get a hold of. Uh, a lot of it's repurposed. Obviously, the barrels are repurposed. So I kind of like that. The only thing we bought new were the two um, jacketed. 10 barrel fermenters. So, so I'm looking at uh, some of your offerings here. It looks like you have, uh, let's see here. You got a cream ale, an American blonde, a pale ale, amber ale, another American bronze, uh, a couple porters, some IPAs. So, I mean, you're brewing a lot of different beers here. It looks like. Yeah, we do a lot. Um, it keeps me busy. We brewed, I think about 28 different styles, um, just last year, um, in 2014. Um, not including our staples, which is our Eldorado IPA, which is our double IPA, our cream ale, um, and then we do our seasonal IPAs also. So then on the serving end of things, you said you have a uh, small tap room, and that's is that where you sell most of your beer now? Yeah, we do. It's around 80%, um, and we do uh, have a 10 taps. Um, it's right off the cold box, and it's kind of a nice little bar setup. It's a little bit more, um, a little more feel to it um, than your industrial brewery. Um, nice place to hang out. We have food trucks every once in a while, people bring food in, you know, your typical brewery thing. So it nice. works. But you don't serve food, right? I mean, that was something we discussed before. No, we don't. Um, and we have thought about, um, later on down the line, um, uh, maybe adding some small food. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute here towards the end of the, we have some other expansion ideas that we're trying to work on too. So. So oh. what's, uh, what's been the reaction of the public to your beer? Um, it's been good. You know, we don't make a lot of beer, um, obviously in the grand scheme of things. Um, so we have to be pretty much, um, careful on how much we put out in the marketplace. So we don't oversell on the outside. So we lose beers on the inside we run out. So that's, um, that's important. 
Uh, but you know, we're slowly getting more and more traction. And I, th- I think that's kind of goes along with our, our motto and our business plan to just kind of the best word of mouth you're going to get is somebody saying how good of a beer they are and they'll tell their friends. And, um, it's, it's, um, it's a slow growth process. So I noticed your, uh, your bottling now and you get some pretty high end packaging yeah. here with the, the sealant on the top, uh, the wax on the top by the bottles and so on. Yeah. And oversized bottles. Obviously, you're you're pushing for the high end here. Um, what what pushed you to go into bottling? Um, there's a few reasons. Most of the Belgian beers that obviously that I like um, should be bottled and bottle conditioned. Um, they pre- presentation's much better out of the bottle. Um, that beer you just held up, the Cardinals, are Flanders Red. Um, yeah. We won gold this in the here? California. Yep, Cal- gold in the California State Fair with that one. Um, and then um, there's actually a, you have a Belgian triple too, the Window of Opportunity. We went gold in the Belgian style with with that one too. So, um, you know, we're making. I feel we're making fairly good Belgian style beers, and I enjoy those. Um, and you know, the price point is a little higher. Um, out here in California, there's mm-hmm. plenty of IPAs on the shelf, and I'm. It freaks me out. We have bottled our IPAs once in a, in a while, and they just they age fairly quickly, and it's not the same beer that you intended or come out of the tap that end up in a bottle. Mm-hmm. So. I think the Belgian ones will hold up longer. I'm not freaking out that if they sit warm because they are barrel conditioned. So, and they present better. So, and they last longer on the shelf. Now there's a market. It takes a little bit longer to create some of these uh, Belgian beers though, right? Especially some of the sours. Yeah. I mean, the Cardinals over a year, I mean, we literally started making that beer the day we opened. Um, You know, it sits in Oak and there's there's a Cardinal right there. Yeah. Yeah. It takes a while. Um, even like the, even the Saison's it's six months for those. And then another two months in the bottle. Um, we take a while That's to, peach one I'm drinking right now. Yeah. We take a while to, uh, make sure they're bottle conditioned and, and properly ready to go before we put them out in the public. So Michael, tell me a little bit about your typical bottling day. Yeah, obviously we do the Belgian styles. So, um, we don't use a, out here in California, we have, you can get a mobile bottler and most of that stuff's carbonated 22s and, Obviously, um, as Brad showed you, we have uh, 500 milliliter bottles. Um, Mm -hmm. Wanted something to, obviously, presentation's um, important to us, obviously, for the beers that we make. Um, I'm holding one here. There's a half half liter bottle. Yeah. So we'll, um, for instance, if we have four barrels, um, these are wine barrels, we Mm -hmm. will figure out... um, which ones we like or dislike so far i haven't had to dump anything um so they've all been good um so we'll blend those four barrels we'll pump them into it's pretty much a giant plastic conical mm-hmm. um and so then we'll blending tank is what you call it right yep yep and then we'll figure out you know so obviously you're not going to pump all 59 gallons out because of there's true or if we used mm-hmm. fruit depending on the beer um and then we'll figure out how much beer we have at that point um, calculate the needed, um, bottling sugar, which obviously your nice little, um, program does that for us. Sure. Um, and then we will, uh, pretty much put the yeast in there. We use, um, so you put some fresh we, yeast in cause these have been aged for a long time. So in, yeah. in many cases, and right? everything's, I mean, they come in to the blending tank almost pretty much crystal clear. Um, if you chill them down, they'll have a little chill haze, but so you're mm-hmm. going to need some, add, add some fresh yeast to them. Um, especially some of the bigger beers we do, um, one called the morning star, which you have there. It's 11 and a half percent. Yep. We do another one. There we go. Yep. So obviously you're going to want good fresh yeast to do for that one, because if not, it's just not going to carbonate. Um, put the pumps on. We just run a little small pump, um, nice and smooth out the bottom through the racking arm just, and then let it run for about half an hour, 40 minutes. Everything's, and then we'll run, um, we have a forehead filler, which is more so these similar. Are, these are naturally car- yeah. car- naturally carbonated, then, right? right? Yep, they're carbonated. Yep. We so they're not um, filtered. Force they're not uh, not force carbonated. Nope. Fantastic. Um, more a little bit old old world, and you know that gives them a little bit of shelf life too. That's kind of my thinking that as with that, um, mm-hmm. uh, make sure we do add fresh yeast um, so it doesn't autolysize and give off flavors. You know, that's important. Um, but our bottling line is more reminiscent of a, of a wine filler because um, obviously mm-hmm. we don't need to worry about carbonation. We do flush them um, with CO2. Um, I don't know how much that helps or not, but it kind of makes me feel better. So I, <laughs> Can't so hurt. we do it. 
Yeah, it's exactly. Can't hurt. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we fell them. We, well, we have a little alley behind us by the roll up door. Um, mm-hmm. so we'll kind of take over the alleyway and, and, um, the bottling line will be in the brewery. The weather's here is usually well. Um, so we have to, you know, obviously pick our days that we do things. Well, you haven't uh, had any rain in like two or three years, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> it's hopefully California. it's supposed to rain this week. Hopefully it's supposed to rain this weekend. So, um, so yeah, it, it's more of an assembly line. We get our friends and, and, uh, you know, long days of, uh, forehead fillers with, uh, um, you know, 300 and some. And you got them all sealed with wax or at least a lot of them yeah. are, uh, are wax sealed, yeah. which is kind of nice. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll usually do the wax at a later date because it's, it becomes, um, it's bad enough to get them clean and put the labels on them. Mm-hmm. Um, it makes for a long, makes for a long day when we're running 2200 bottles, um, four at a time. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, so how often do you have to bottle? Is it every week, every month? It's about once a month. Um, we did for our membership, we did 14 beers altogether. Mm-hmm. Um, 10 of them were membership only beers. Um, what's your, what's your member? Those, tell me about your membership program. We haven't talked about that. Yeah. So well, for 2000, obviously the idea was thinking is like, obviously we have these uh, barrel beers and we m- want to be able to put them in the people's hands that want them. Um, obviously we're a very small, uh, limited number of bottles. Mm-hmm. If there's something you want, you want to make sure you can get it. Um, so last year we did 10, um, 10 different beers. Um, and for instance, on bottling day, we, there's, we did blondes, one with cherries, one with blueberries and one with raspberries. And we did all those three in one day. So that kind of, but we did 14 different beers bottling last year. Mm-hmm. Um, and depending on the lot and how much we had, like obviously the Cardinal, um, which is our Flanders red, uh, that was a full day just alone in that. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. usually our Belgian triple our window of opportunity, that's a full day of just doing that. And those, that's a full pallet and we get about 2,200 bottles. Out so, of those. so it looks like the members uh, pay a pay a, a membership fee, but then they uh, yeah. they get access to these early these very yeah. special special age beers, right? Yep, very yep. cool. And that gives you know people like to be a part of things. I mean, I do too. There's a few breweries around here that um you know that I'm a membership on, and so it's I'm just as big a beer geek as anybody else. I'm just having to get, I'm lucky enough to make it too. So <laughs> um, it's, it's always nice. Nice. <laughs> so, yep. Um, tell me a little about ordering your bottles and supplies. Uh, I understand that's a bit of a challenge. Um, yeah, when we do order stuff, obviously when you think of small scale stuff, uh, the added cost does sneak up as far as Mm -hmm. deliveries. Um, we don't have any extra room. So for instance, a bottling day, I have to make sure I talk specific dates with the, the freight companies so they show up. Um, because they literally have to either sit in the brewery, which I can't do anything else, um, cause they sit right in the middle of the brewery or we, they show up that day and we start bottling. Um, so, and we'll leave those, you know, in the alley, um, to give us some room. So, you know, that's logistic wise. Um, it's very important on with small breweries. <laughs> um, and then, you know, all of a sudden you'll get a pallet of, you know, we order growlers and you have to order a full pallet, if not two of them to make the price point decent. Mm-hmm. Um, same with shirts, swags. And then you think about, okay, where are we going to put all that? Um, so we have a lot of shelves. Yeah, I was going to say, where do you, where do you put everything? <laughs> yeah, a lot of shelves. Um, we became very um, good with um, spacing out the brewery. Uh, we were lucky enough to start with an empty shell, and we kind of built everything, <clears throat> um, framed everything to fit everything exactly where we wanted it. Um, the bathroom's all ADA compliant to this, you know, to the inch. Um with the countertops were spaced mm-hmm. just enough to have one or two people working behind it. Um, it doesn't work with three, but it gives us enough seating in the tap room. Um, and then the, on the breweries, we built it big enough to hold um, the two 10 barrel fermenters. We do have the ceilings for a 20 barrel fermenter in there. We actually could fit one. Um, mm-hmm. It might be difficult to get it in there. Um, we're still working on that. So we might have to move out the blending tank uh, and put a 20 barrel uh, fermenter. So that'll obviously increase our production. So we can do that. Um, you know, the thought process is now is we'll continue to run what we have. Do we um, move the brewery to the to the new facility later on down the year? And and um, you know, well, obviously that will be a lot easier to putting tanks in. Give you a little more room, yeah. Yeah, certainly some room it, to it, store. Yeah, and even on that side, obviously not having a forklift at a brewery is um, is. Is, is difficult because when we right, order tanks, I mean, if you, even if you order yeah. just grains, most of them come on a pallet, right? Yeah. yeah. 
they come on pallets and the, you have Pegs to order come a truck. On pallet. Everything comes on a pallet, right? So the, the, the lift gate, um, cost is an added, most deliveries, you can mm-hmm. get that with the, with a single pallet, um, or multiple pallets. Um, the bigger stuff like tanks, um, barrels, things like that. Most of those are through freight companies that don't have, um, options for lift gates. Obviously you can't put a, a fermenter on a lift gate and unload it. So, um, that becomes a logistic issue too. And that's kind of one of what we're trying to figure out what to do with the 20 barrel. And usually how I'll do it is I'll drop it off at either a friend's brewery or, um, I'm really good friends with, a, a, a few of the warehouses that we'll just drop it off over there and then load it, um, in the back of the truck or something and, and drive it over to the brewery. Very cool. So, yeah. So, I mean, it's, we do a lot more manual labor, I think, than uh, most, uh, but it's, it's doable. It, it is, but don't be afraid to work. So, so uh, tell me a little about these uh, four beers you sent me. I'm going to start with uh, the first one here is the Cardinal. Yep. So that's our uh, Cardinal. That's our kind of our Flanders red style. Um, I don't think it's, I don't say it's a textbook Flanders red, but it's kind of that style. It gives you an idea. Um, obviously a red ale. Um, we, mm-hmm. we aged it in, um, sour, red wine obviously sour beer, right? Yep. And we aged it with Brett Lacto and PDO. Um, and there is a little bit of cherries in there too, to kind of accentuate some of those PDO notes. And, um, it, uh, it was aged for, for quite some time, almost a year. So it's, um, it's, it, it's turned out really nice. So the next one is the morning star. Yeah. The morning stars, um, it's an Imperial golden strong. So I think of a Duval at 11 and a half percent. Um, we make a base beer called the gift and we usually mm-hmm. make it the day after Christmas. Um, and, um, it's a fine beer in itself, but we'll leave a little bit behind in the, um, fermentation tank and then add, um, some dark tart cherries to it. Um, and so it comes out, um, nice and red in color with a nice foam on top. Um, so it is, it's, it's, it's not really a fruit forward beer, but it does have nice color. It's, um, a little bit more drier. So we actually get a lot of the, the people that are looking for more of a wine um they seem to gravitate towards that beer awesome and the next one's the window of opportunity yep that's kind of one of the first beers we started with i've always um brewed a belgian style triple or a golden strong and that's the one that um we just uh stuck with i brewed it um there's a brewery down in southern california called Ladyface, and i actually brewed that beer for a pro-am beer with them and you said that's um, a triple on, triple or a golden strong i'm trying to see that that one's a that one's a tr- that one's a triple Triple, right? just, yeah. So as a home brewer, I made that, um, beer sort of similar to that recipe, but, um, pretty similar. Um, I was able to brew it as a pro-am beer for the great American beer fest. So mm-hmm. obviously once we became, um, professional, I decided to continue making it and we picked up a gold in the state fair this year. So I was happy with that. That's awesome. Yeah. And then the last one, which I'm drinking right now is the, uh, Saison de Peach, uh, which we talked yeah. a little bit about earlier. Yeah. Uh, tell, um, go ahead. Um, that's our latest release. Um, obviously, um, more of the Belgian farmhouse styles. Yeah. Excuse me. 30 zero. Um, yep. Uh, the, it's been really well received. We've pretty much sold out of it in a week. Uh, so that it's, was nice. It's got a lovely, yeah. uh, sort of yeah. sour peach flavor to it. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. I kept it on the tartar side. Um, didn't want it over the tart, over the top sour, but just a nice little tartness to it. Um, finishes dry. The Brett helps with that. Um, but there's nice fresh peach aroma and flavor on it. So it seems to be the more you drink it, the tartness kind of goes away and the fruit kind of, you know, in the Saison pepperiness kind of falls in line. And it's, it's just really nice. I've been drinking yeah. this for 30 minutes or so, and it's yeah. still got, you know, sort of a nice aroma to it and flavor to it. Yeah. And as it warms up, it changes too. And that's kind of nice about the Belgian beers is they do continue to change if you leave them out. So really nice. Thank you. Have you, uh, what, what's your distribution network now for the bottling? Um, quite a few local bottle shops. Um, we're working on some bigger chains, um, for, you know, s- your grocery store outlets and, and alcohol places like that. But most of them are just little craft beer places. Um, you know, they have, they sell our draft also and they have a nice little bottle shop. So, you know, it's, it makes an easy sale for us. Has it we're been hard to get into the distribution networks or, or has it been fairly easy? It's a lot of footwork. Um, more, the more people hear about you, obviously the easier it is. So if they haven't heard about you, it's, it's a little bit more work. Um, but with those styles of beer, you know, they're, they're they know that they can sit on for a little while and, and that's, that helps. So what are, uh, what are some of the challenges you run into day to day running a really, really small brewery? 
Um, so for instance, when you think about what we do and how a brewery works, it works on deliveries. So we either get in, for instance, when we do bottling, um, we can't order 10 pallets and forklift them off the truck. We pretty much have to figure out exactly how much we need. Um, and deliveries, cause obviously our quantities are less. So, you know, the freight costs more as, as over, an overall picture of the cost of the bottles. Um, cause we can only get one or two pallets. Um, freight's more because we don't have a forklift. We deal with, you know, lift gates and that's an added cost, which, and you know, all those little things do add up. Um, mm-hmm. but the offset is we don't need to pay for a forklift. So, um, you know, that's kind of if, ands or buts on if it's worth it or not. Um, and then we don't mill our grain, all our grains pre-milled. So we kind of make sure that we're using our grain within a month or two. Our climate's a little bit drier out here in California. So mm-hmm. I feel that, um, you know, I haven't seen any efficiency loss um, when I have some grains that's over, you know, a month and a half old. So they seem to be fine. And we store them fairly well. So those are, you know, two issues that we deal with. You know, we have to do um, small ordering. Um, so that increases our cost. Um, things are done at the brewery pretty much one day at a time. One day is cake cleaning. One day is, you know, cleaning the fermenters. Next day is brewing. We can't really overlap a bunch of things because, for one, we don't have space. Um, and we don't have the logistics to make that happen. So, so have you got, the, uh, have you got any employees now? We do. We have, um, another gentleman that helps me out in the brewery, um, from time to time. And then we have two people that run the front tap room and both those people do deliveries. Uh, do you have partners as well or no? Um, yeah, we do have a few, obviously my wife. Um, and then I have two other partners and they're pretty much silent partners. They got their own day jobs, but they've helped me out and, when I need one of them's a contractor. So when we do permitting issues with that, um, he helps, he's been a really big help with that. So you, you quit your uh, full-time job. I mean, this is your full-time job now, right? Yeah, it is. For, for and almost two years. Yeah. And we just, so I've been pretty much brewing all the beer and doing all the work in the back. Um, for the last two years, we just you're, hired somebody you're else. The brew, back you're the brewmaster. Yeah. I pretty much call it the glorified janitor. We do everything. <laughs> so it, um, it's glorious work. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I, it, in the grand scheme of things, you know, if I do my job correctly and I do do my job well, if it's, you know, cleaning, making good beer, whatever it is, you know, cleaning, sanitizing, um, proper pitching rates for the yeast, you know, mm-hmm. I'm helping the yeast work. I'm helping the people in the front tap room make their job easier to sell. You know, it's much easier to sell good beer than it is bad beer. Um, and same with my outside accounts. If it's, you know, I help you think of it like that is more of a servant mentality that what we do if I can make everybody else's job easier, in turn, I'm going to sell more beer. So, so how do you how do you do some of these really long storage beers uh, in such a small space? Well, we have an extra hundred square feet, and it'll fit twelve barrels in there. We pretty much have to hand roll them in, um, hand stack them, and empty them. They, we can't forklift them in or out, so they pretty much filled in place and emptied in place. But we, you know, that'll get us enough um, beer and. We, like I said, we're, you know, most of those batches are pretty small quantities. So three or four barrels at a time, not now, a lot, but en- enough for us. Now, when we talked to you, uh, the first time you had a pretty elaborate business plan set up, how has that uh, turned out? And what are some of the things you learned from the business plan versus how, how reality works? Um, it worked out fairly well. You know, once you start crunching numbers and figure out how much beer you need to sell, um, what you need to do, it, it kind of gets you in a generalized direction. Um, I don't know about super detailed because of the fact that, um, you know, things change, you know, you might've thought that you're doing X amount of sales through the tap room, but it ended up being, you know, more out the back or, or something else. Um, and your merchandise sales wasn't as good as you thought. Hold on a second. Mm-hmm. Sorry about that. Everybody's trying to get a hold of me. That's okay. Um, so is a rudimentary business plan, and it's been fairly good. Um, we've grown exponentially, and I think we're kind of grown out of our business plan of where we are. Uh, we had options to take over the spot next door, mm-hmm. um, and we actually declined because of I thought for what we're doing and where we're at, um, it's better to go get space somewhere else. So we just finished up the lease on another 3,000 square feet out in an industrial park area just for storage. So you, um, you just did that, right? Yeah, we just inked the deal a couple of weeks ago. So, And that'll let us do more of our beer aging. Um, we can put our extra bottle runs over there, our extra boxes, 
Um, all the things that are in my garage and my wife's not happy about, we can move out there. So that'll help. Um, and then maybe in a year or six months or eight months, depending on how things move about, um, start, you know, maybe we'll start brewing out there and we can turn the existing tap room, um, into something a little bigger, but we, it, it we're flexible. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no set, nothing set in stone. Um, my goal is to have more barrels and more Oak. Um, and if we can continue to do that, I'll be happy. So is that, is that space set up for, uh, for brewing out there as well? It's pretty it much an empty. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. the really tall ceilings in it. Um, it's got really nice, um, building. It's nothing's been in it. It's brand new. Uh, we have to do the floor drains and all the other stuff that go along with it. Um, but we're not in a rush out there. Um, I'm thinking we don't have to be open right away because we already are. Um, so as we grow, we can use that space and, if things continue to be on the pace we are, you know, like I said, within eight months to maybe a year, we'll probably have to be brewing out there. And you know, we can move our existing five barrel brew house out there, or, you know, we might think about buying something bigger, but we'll have to see how, how everything goes. We're not, I'm not really excited to borrow a bunch of money and um, start all over again, as, as we say, and, and, and be indebted to somebody else. Uh, seems, I to be, like, uh, seems to be what a lot of people do. They get, they get successful with their brewery and they go out and, you know, borrow, yeah. borrow a million bucks for the next phase or whatever. Yeah, I, I think we can do it the other way, and we'll have to wait and see how things pencil out and how we're doing. But I don't have any intentions to do that. Um, it's, we are, you know, it's, I mean, it does make it easier because you can, you know, when you talk to investors or banks, whatever, we have market share, we have accounts, we have, you know, a business model, things are working, mm -hmm. you know, and businesses like to see that. So it's not... A bad thing to start small, get some market share, some accounts, start understanding how the, the back ends work. As mm -hmm. I always say, everybody asks about, you know, making the beer. I said that making the beer is the easiest part. That's the funnest part. <laughs> it's all the paperwork and the business side because we do run a small business with the front of the house. We run a manufacturing side in the back of the house, the distribution side, a bottling side. So those are all avenues and different ways to generate income. Um, but it's also it keeps me busy. Yeah, I'm I'm familiar with that because I do all the marketing and all, everything for Beersmith yeah. too, uh, plus all the software. So yeah, uh, yeah it's a challenge. I, I did find a picture here. Here's a picture of your three thousand. Yeah. Your new. I found this on your blog. This is your new. Oh, yeah. uh, three thousand yep. square foot facility. It looks a little bigger than the old one, right? Yeah, a lot bigger. That's actually six thousand. They'll put a wall up halfway in between it, but yeah. But yeah, that's pretty much it. So you can see nice tall ceilings. We can put big tanks and lots of oak, fooders, barrels, things things that we can age some beer so in. How, how so. far away is that? It's about uh, a mile and a half from the brewery. So, and we originally thought, you know, if, because of where we are, we, you think of demographics, we're just outside of Sacramento. So mm -hmm. really where we pull from, um, as far as, you know, if you look at the demographics, a circle, you draw a circle, a 10 mile radius around the brewery. We really only pull from about half of that circle because of, we're mm -hmm. kind of at the outer end of the population. Um, there's the foothills on the other, on the, you on said the East El Dorado Hills, yeah. right? Is where you are. Yeah. At? Yeah. So we're just at the base of the Sierra Nevada mountains. So, um, as far as, so our population load is not a lot. Um, so I wanted to be next to some really, um, obviously populated, uh, subdivisions and neighborhoods. So that's kind of why we picked our spot there where we're at. That helped along with obviously, you know, the lands awards were really nice to us and everything worked out well. Now, one of the things I like is you've been blogging uh, this entire experience at uh, admirazbrewingcompany.com. dot com. Uh, there's a blog link there. Um, yep. Tell us, tell us why you're doing that and what 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 that's taught you. Um, obviously it keeps the people up to date. You know, people are always interested in what I do, and I think any brewer people want to know what we're doing and what's coming up next and what's new and exciting and. Uh, so that's kind of gives me a little bit more um, way to communicate with people. Uh, I think it's the same thing that you do. It's an easy way to get um, our information out there, our story out there, mm -hmm. um, let people talk about us. So it, and like I said, it's it's fun to get some things out there. And we do have a barrel membership too. So I want to you know make sure those people are informed and and uh, you know they know what's going on. Mm -hmm. So what uh, what are some of your plans for the future in terms of expansion and growth? Obviously, you got the new facility, yeah. but uh, beyond that, yeah, um, continue what we're doing. Um, I'm happy with um, the beers we're making right now. I think that they're, they're they're tasting really well. Um, my fear is obviously if you get too 
popular too quick, we'll run out of the beers that, you know, some of the barrel aged ones. So that's kind of why the thought process is mm-hmm. of the storage facility is we can start understanding um, our load on some of those bottles and make sure the public can get them and not like, if, for instance, if we run out of the Cardinal, you know, we, nobody will see that beer again for another year and a half. <laughs> so, and you know, as they say, I want to be able to give it to them. So if they want to buy it, I want to be able to give it to them. So, so how much, uh, how much do you brew of something like this at a time? This is the Cardinal here. I guess I'm holding up. That one was, we did about six barrels. So it wasn't a bunch. Yeah. In the grand scheme of things, in some of the bigger breweries, thousands and thousands, if not even a hundred, you know, is quite a bit. So we did six and, you know, the idea if we can do 20 in the new facility, that'll be, you know, give us some options. And that, you know, obviously with more barrels gives you options to blend too. You don't have to have, you you start making single barrel beers um, and sometimes they could be amazing, (laughs) but they could be, they could be lackluster and missing something or missing a little bit more tartness, a little bit more roast. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you can pull from some of the other barrels to be able to get what you want, kind of more of that winemaker's thinking of that, you know, I'm trying to put, this is my picture and this is the beer that I want to put in the bottle. I want to be able to do that. Well, obviously there's a lot of uh, micro and nano breweries running around. What, uh, what do you think really makes your brewing company different? Um, I don't know what makes it different. Um, and the, I, th- I think that we do a little bit more eclectic style beers. Um, you know, those beers that you have there are uh, definitely on the higher end. Um, mm-hmm. at least there's, we're kind of in the IPA land up here in California. Um, um, and I, I do love a great IPA, but I think some of those specialty ones just do add something a little bit, a little bit, something nice to it. Yeah. I think I had Mitch Steele from stone yeah. the other day and he said it was, yeah. I think over 40% of their production was IPA. Now. Yeah. Pretty yeah. Amazing. I mean, we, on our draft side, I wouldn't doubt it. We do. I haven't looked at the numbers, but um, yeah, we're probably pretty close to that. Every batch right now of our IPAs that we make is pretty much pre-sold. If mm-hmm. I have to save some kegs for us and everything else goes out the back. Um, good problem to have. Um, that's kind of why we need to make more. Are, are you um, selling kegs but, as well? I know you got the nice bottles, but uh, are you yeah, selling Yeah, we probably have about, we have about 35 outside accounts for keg For kegs, okay. For yeah. Kegs. Yep. Very cool. And is most of that going in the local area, I assume? Yeah. Um, we got some stuff further away from, I, obviously, I've been in the beer industry for some while. And and uh, so we have uh, some of, I always say, my friends down in the Bay Area. Um, it's about an hour and a half drive. Um, mm-hmm. so, that, so, you know, they always want my beer. So I always, you know, I'm always obliged to go down there and say hi and take them some beer, so. So you're, uh, you're two years into this experiment. You sunk uh, a lot of your own personal fortune into it. Uh, what do you think so far? Is it, has it been worth it? Yeah, it did. I, I, I really do. I, I don't think I could would want to do anything else. Um, you know, I was, I was, I've worked on cars, mechanics, I've sold insurance. I've done quite a lot of other things. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously very mechanically inclined. Um, but I've always loved beer and, and I love the making of the process. Um, at least at this point in my life, I don't think I'd want to do anything else. Mm-hmm. Um, I, re- I really enjoy it. I enjoy the people. And that's kind of the one thing that you didn't think about when we opened our, our tap room is the friends and, you know, regulars that come in and the people you meet and the relationships you build with those people. That, that, that's probably the more priceless thing that you, um, you acquire and being so small, um, you know, I'm able to talk to those people, run the tap room every once in a while, you know, hang out with them, talk to them, um, see what they like and what they don't like. And, you know, that's a nice personal aspect that I, um, I get. Oh, that sounds a little better than pumping yeah. out tons of tons of gallons of beer right yeah um and that was that's never my goal um i, I i've been to a few a few huge giant production facilities and they're beautiful and some of it i'm jealous of all the the facilities they have and in, in stainless but um i don't that's not my goal and that's not my dream to have something that big um well, could you give us some advice for somebody looking to do something similar, looking to dive into, uh, you know, maybe open a micro or even a nano brewery? Um, I, it's, it's, it's tough to do it by yourself. So you're going to need some friends. And obviously if, if you're going to acquire, um, some investors, make sure they can put some time and effort into it. Um, mm-hmm. obviously contractor friends are nice. Plumbing friends are nice. <laughs> um, things like that, obviously, because that's going to be a majority of where your money's going to have to go. Um, of hiring people to build out. Um, and don't be afraid to trade. Uh, you know, people always like beer. Um, so that's always nice. 
Uh, and if it's your passion, but realize it's, it's not just about the making beer. If, if I only made four batches of beer, um, and said, I'm going to go open a brewery, uh, I would think I would be definitely overloaded because I don't have to think about making beer. That's kind of one of those things that I kind of understand. Um, so that's the fun part of the business. Um, but I enjoy all aspects of it. Like I said, from hanging out in the tap room and meeting friends and as much as it is, you know, you just like any other business, there's paperwork that needs to be done. And, um, mm-hmm. just understand you need to manage your time. You know, have supporting people or have supporting people around you because you'll be doing a majority of the work. So tell us about the uh, business aspect of things. How is that? You know, what are some of the challenges you run into there? It's just a lot of, we, like I said, we run a manufacturing facility. So we do a lot of paperwork. We deal with the TTB, which is a federal government. Mm -hmm. Um, We deal with the ABC, which is a California alcohol and tobacco. Or, well, not, excuse me, the uh, California beverage control. So you have to fill out all their forms and they track everything, right? Yep. You're paying taxes on both of them. You have sales tax issues. You have, uh, out here in California, we have the California Redemption, which is the, because we do manufacturing of bottles. Oh, um, yeah. and we sell those. So we have to deal with that stuff. Um, and you know, sitting down and doing, it's not that big a deal, but it does take time. So should um, I uh, send these back to California for what are they, a nickel or a dime? Nope. I paid five cents for that. So you can five cents. It. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, we had, you know, those are records you have to keep and it has no, to be clean and, and organized and, <laughs> and you know, that's a, you can't let those things build up and get away from you. And <laughs> you still, you still have your regular books. Um, sure. you know, we have kegs logs for all the kegs that go out to our accounts to make sure we're not losing those. Cause that's a huge additional cost. Um, you know, we just ordered another 40 kegs and we're looking to order another 50 of the smaller five gallon kegs too. So we make money, we spend money. Absolutely. Know, my motto at this point, cause we grow and, you know, in hindsight is, should we have got a huge loan and, and borrowed a bunch more money so we can kind of be where we wanted to be and, and then pay that back and mm-hmm. or hopefully pay it back. Um, I don't know. I want. I guess when in 10, 20 years we can make that decision. But I have a lot of other friends that own really large breweries, and they still haven't paid their investors back because they're in the same process. They're growing and trying to expand, and um, so you know my nope. my bills are paid. I still got the house, so I'm happy, <laughs> and I'm doing what I love. So that's always a bonus. Well, that's that's got a lot of yeah. value too. Certainly, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, I wanted to ask you, is, is, uh, uh, is the marketing end of things really hard to do? Is it hard to push the beer out and sell it? Um, I don't want to say we're fortunate that we make good beer, but, um, it's, that's one of my, um, obviously huge, huge adamants. I mean, I, mean sure. I ask cause it's a crowded yeah. market, obviously, even, uh, you know, even in the, in the yeah. craft brewery, it's getting more and more crowded, right? Yeah, it is. Um, we have obviously, so we have three different avenues to make money. We have our tap room, which pretty much pays for all everything that I needed to. And that was part of the business plan that no matter what happens outside our sales um, accounts, that our tap room will cover us and cover our space. And so that's one of the reasons why we decided to stay small and not get a huge building and, and rely on outside sales or something else later on down the line. We wanted to make sure we were in the black extremely fast. Um, and then we can continue to move from there. Um, so as far as marketing, you know, there, um, obviously social media is a big thing. We do events, um, to keep your, your, your name out there. Mm -hmm. Obviously I'm talking with you, Brad. So, you know, every little bit helps. Um, it, it's a tough, it, it definitely keeps you on your toes. Social media is consuming. Um, but that's, that's the world we live in. So you have to do it. Yeah. So, uh, and, you know, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, like back to the beer. Um, yeah, you know, that's obviously been one of my, um, you know, pet peeves is making sure that the beer out in the marketplace is extremely good. Mm-hmm. Um, and we do, and that's just trying to make sure the beer is the best it should be out there. Um, if there's problems with it, you know, we correct it. Uh, not saying that we're perfect, uh, but you want to be able to, it's not about just pushing beer. It's about putting every beer that you put in somebody's hand. is a calling card, um, to come back to you. So, um, well, uh, I wanted to ask, uh, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, if you have any questions, just send me an email. I might not get right to it. Um, but, uh, you know, I can help answer anything as far as working your way through it. Um, yeah, you got it right down, enjoy. Uh, right down yeah. on the front page. It's uh Mraz brewing at packbell.net. Yeah. P-A-C-Bell.net. Yep. 
and we're uh, continuing to grow. We, you know, we're we're doing well this year so far already, and uh, we have goals, and we're we're exceeding those goals. Um, and if we can keep it um, consistently growing organically and um, and moving forward, we'll continue to do that. Um, kind of happy where we are, and you know, if we can, um, I would say, if we can continue to get more barrels and fill those and get them out in the public, um, and they're enjoying them, I'll be happy. So two years into it, you're doing great, right? Yeah. Yep. I think we are. I mean, um, you know, everybody has their ups and downs. There's struggles here and there. Like you said, that you know, you make a bunch of money and you spend it. You know, all of a sudden it's like, oh, look, we got a <laughs> bunch more money in the bank. And then, oh, yeah, I got to buy more kegs. Or even the fun ones are the sales tax quarterly things. Those are always fun. Yeah, yeah. But, you if, know, you, those, if you're a business owner, you get yeah. to pay taxes every quarter, which uh, yeah. is, they don't just come out of your paycheck, right? Nope. Yeah. Everything's done quarterly. You write and, a big uh, check that, instead. They don't like you being late. <laughs> no no they don't <laughs> yeah so i feel your pain michael yeah i had a benefit i owned a small automotive business with my dad um before i opened the brewery mm -hmm. so i understood a little bit of that back end stuff it could be overwhelming if you've never if you come from the w2 world where somebody else has paid all your bills and then all of a sudden you have to do all this stuff it's um find a good bookkeeper um find somebody that knows what they're doing um if you want to do this that's probably yeah, I, I was amazed paperwork I I, I, yeah. I hired myself. Uh, I can't remember what it was, but I, you know, I switched yeah. switched from a small company to a little bit bigger, and hired myself on, and it was like you know six or eight taxes I had to pay every month on top of the regular ones. Yeah, <laughs> it's just astounding to me. Yeah, I mean that's just the nature of the beast. That's what they are. You have to do it. I mean, we all kind of mumble about it, but it's easier just to do it. Don't be late. Get on time. Keep everything organized. That's just like I said. If you don't, things will get piled up, and your desk will be overwhelming. <laughs> Yeah. Well, Michael, I uh, appreciate yeah. you taking the time out of your very, very busy schedule to, to spend a few minutes with us. And um, uh, thank you again. Thank you. Hope I answered all your questions. So again, uh, today my guest was Michael Moraz. He opened uh, Moraz Brewing Company a little over, actually just a little under two years ago. And you can find him at uh, MorazBrewingCompany.com or you can visit the tap room at El Dorado Hills, California. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Brad. Thank you to Michael Moraz for joining me today. Thanks also to our sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine, now offering six issues a year at 15% off everything in their store. Head on over to beerandbrewing.com and use the coupon code BEERSMITH2015 when you check out to get your discount on this great new brewing magazine. Also a reminder to check out Beersmith Mobile for your iPhone, Android, Kindle Fire, or mobile device at beersmith.com slash mobile. Create great beer recipes on the go. Pull it out at your next business meeting to save your sanity. Beersmith Mobile, the perfect distraction at work. Available on iTunes, Google Play, and the Amazon App Store. Finally, thank you for your continued support, and thank you for listening. I hope you have a great brewing week. Mm -hmm.